thanks for coming, everyone. Uh, I'm going to give you a little snip of the day of any, some of the wisdom I learned uh, between when I moved, uh, when I finished my postdoc and when I moved down to California and moved down here in 2019 in the fall. Uh, I welcome questions. I got the chat open in the side here, or if you turn your microphone on, I welcome questions during the presentation. Uh, if it was in person, I'd probably have about three slides, but instead I have about 25 slides. They're all words. I don't want you to sit here and read the words. I just want to be more conversational. I'm going to sit here and talk to you about some of these things. If you want me to elaborate on anything, uh, you can just feel free to stop me. Uh, the slides are more so that when they share the recording, if you want a particular piece of information, I'll already have the information kind of bullet point for you and you don't have to listen to my voice for 30 minutes to find that one bullet point you wanted to uh, look up. Uh, so, there we go. I wanna bring this up to kind of the old way of thinking. When I started my PhD, this was kind of the way we thought about academia versus industry. And the first thing I was told when I moved down to Silicon Valley is you do not call it industry. Uh, if you're going to call something called biotech, you can call it pharmaceuticals, drug discovery, but biotech, everyone accepts. Uh, and I hope to share with you today that I don't think this is the way it is anymore. After spending time on both sides of the fence, uh, it really isn't a shady selling out kind of idea that it's actually a very noble endeavor. And it's very fulfilling. So today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, working in a startup, how you can use your academic training, what I found are the major differences between working in an academic posting versus a biotechnology posting. Uh, and then I did spend a little bit of time at a larger company, so I can tell you a little bit about what I've noticed about the differences between working in a startup versus one of these larger companies. Uh, I can also share with you some of the information I learned on the job hunt that I can tell you that I was not successful at first on my job hunt. I had a lot of people give me some pointers. I went to some workshops. So I kind of tried to cram that into a couple of slides with a bunch of bullet points to give you the um, highlights of what I learned in some of these seminars that might help you when you're looking at, uh, looking at a job hunt. Um, so it's like, how do you sell yourself? Um, how you use your academic training to prepare for a posting in the biotechnology sector. So if you know you might you want to go to biotech and you're not going to stay in academia, if you're still in your PhD, there's things you can probably do to help prepare yourself for that a little bit better that to focus your transition. And I can uh, give you the short list of how you apply for a TN visa, uh, which is how I'm down here. So I'm here on a temporary work visa that's part of NAFTA. Uh, it's a wonderfully wonderful program to get Canadians a foot in the door down in the States if you want to come down here to work in biotech. Uh, so just a quick thing about me that I did my training in a few different universities, but all in Ontario. So I very much Ontario trained. I was in kinesiology at the University of Waterloo, always looking at glucose supplementation, exercise physiology. So always around glucose metabolism. I went to Sick Kids Hospital in Toronto. Uh, I was at the University of Toronto uh, biochemistry department. I happened to, it wasn't by design, but I ended up staying in glucose metabolism and looking at insulin resistance models, but more at the cellular level and intracellular sorting. And then I hopped down the highway to McMaster. I joined Jonathan Church's lab, uh, who I actually met him when he was a postdoc in the same lab at U of T. Uh, and I came to do a postdoc with him. And again, just happened to stay in glucose metabolism and insulin resistance. So I kind of had a theme that worked in my favor in the end. Uh, and I was looking at microbiota and that's where I got into the microbiota research. And that's what I do now at Schultz Therapeutics is uh, we're very much, we're a microbiota based company. Uh, okay, sorry, I just looked at the chat, but it was Leslie telling them how to ask a question. Uh, so after my postdoc, uh, I moved down to California. Uh, it turns out I didn't have a, you know, I want to go into biotech mentality. I thought I was going to be an academic. I decided that I didn't think I wanted to be a professor because I didn't like the idea of um, running my own small business. I love the science. I wanted to be a scientist, but I did not like the idea of running my own company. company. So 
Uh, I wasn't sure what I was going to do. I thought I'd be a research associate. Uh, there's a question, how long was my postdoc? It's actually six years. Uh, so actually I spent, I had a pretty long academic training. I did a, my four-year undergrad, two and a half year master's, six year PhD, six year postdoc. So I was, a, I was seasoned by the time I got down here, you could say. Um, so when I came down to California, actually it was because my partner at the time, she got a postdoc at Stanford and we were doing long distance while I was a postdoc. I decided I didn't like that. So we got married and I moved down here to be with her. And so I actually just left everything in Canada and moved to the States. I didn't actually have a job lined up before I came here. I started looking after I got here and that's how I fell into the biotech sector as it is now. So there was a steep learning curve when I got here because I came with no intentions and no idea what I was doing. And I had to figure it out once I got here. So hopefully I can share with you some information today that if you decide to come down here, you don't have to go through that little bit of a process. So then my first job was at Bristol Myers Squibb, which is the baby big company. So like they're a small company when it comes to big companies, but they're a massive company relative to where I work now. And I was a team manager there for a transgenic discovery group where they make all the transgenic mouse models for the entire company nationwide. And so I was in charge of about 25 projects of you know, CRISPR, genetic engineering. How do you make, how do you design and make these mice? which was not my background, but it was a fun learning experience. Uh, and then after working at that contract, while I was there, I ended up getting a job offer from Schulte uh, to, and to, they were trying to diversify their portfolio. Uh, so we're an allergic disease company. We're in stage two clinical trials for our lead candidate product, but they wanted to expand that. And they, I was able to get my foot in the door by being a metabolic disease specialist, microbiota-based diseases, they hired me to come uh, start a new drug discovery program. And it was more in my wheelhouse of what I did with my postdoc. So I jumped ship from Bristol Myers Squibb. So I actually left that uh, after contract after five months uh, and jumped into Schulte. Uh, so in terms of Schulte Therapeutics, uh, we're a company that specializes in live biotherapeutic products targeting infant and maternal health. So it means we're a microbiome company. Everything we do is around live biotherapeutics, taking, harvesting microbes from healthy human feces, culturing them, evaluating them, and trying to put them into a, a consortium to make a drug. And that's one of the big differences between us and some of the other companies out here, that there's a handful of companies that are went the drug route. So if you want to make a use bacteria, you can either be a probiotic or you can be a drug. And you have to decide pretty early on. If you want to be a drug, you have to declare it, de declare that you're going to go the regulated FDA drug route. And it's a lot more work that there's a lot more science. You actually have to prove it works, right? So, and go through all this same as small molecule drug discovery. If you want to be a probiotic, you're a health food. You really, the bar is set much lower. There's no regulation on manufacturing. Uh, no one's looking over your shoulder to make sure what's in your product is actually what it is. There's still some very good companies that, you know, still take that responsibility seriously. So it's not that all probiotics are bad, but there's no one regulating them. So it's kind of like take at your own risk. Uh, they do do some small clinical trials to try and prove the efficacy, but the bar is much lower. With the FDA approved drug route, you know, we're a legit prescription drug. Uh, my current role is actually leading the development of a drug for one of our newest indications, which is, uh, which is necrotizing enteric colitis. We're not going to get into the science today. Uh, but the idea is I want to share that, you know, working in a small company is I have to wear many hats. And I'll elaborate on that. But kind of like, even though I'm a senior scientist, I'm in charge of a project. I'm still at the bench every day. Like you're still expected to do your own work. You're kind of like your own technician a lot of the time. And we actually have a pretty small company. So we have five PhD level scientists and one technician. Each scientist kind of leads a particular project and we help each other with the bench work. So if there's a big experiment going on one day, you know, you pull each other aside. It's usually pretty collaborative. We're a wonderful group of people, but I am biased that, towards that. Some companies will have more technicians or junior scientists posts, so they'll have a little more hierarchy. Uh, and as a senior scientist, you'd be expected to manage one to three people. And, depending on how successful your program's going, 
you'll get more resources and either person or equipment allocated to you as you show you succeed. But a lot of times in small companies, it's you know pretty horizontal. Uh, I report directly to the CSO. So my weekly meetings, he's kind of like my PI. If you think of it like a postdoc, it's not terribly different than a postdoc, but it, it is. So it, the structure is similar, but it is different because you are in charge, you have more independence. You're supposed to just know what you're doing, uh, lead the scientific project. Um, but. Let's see if we can get this to that. So the biggest thing about working in a smaller startup is you have to be flexible. So I have to do everything from write grants. There's a, in the States, there's a small business and innovation research. So there's actually grants for companies from the NIH. Uh, so it's kind of like applying to CIHR as a company and there's special grants just for that to progress uh, early phase one trials. Uh, so always on the eye for funding. Um, you're staying on top of your field, same as you have to do as a postdoc. You have to read your papers. You have to stay on top of what's coming out in other labs that might be useful to you. As well in the biotech sector, you're looking at press releases. What are your potential competition doing? What are other companies in the microbiome field doing? Uh, for example, um, another microbiome company this year just was the first company to have anything FDA approved for use in humans. They're not a direct competitor. We're not looking at the same diseases, but it's very important for us to know what the FDA is thinking about microbiome-based drugs because it's a wild, wild west. Nothing's been done before. So everything's being uh, evaluated about how you regulate this as we go. So uh, that's really cool. So anyway, uh, we, again, you're designing your experiments to evaluate your drug uh, candidates. You still, have, a lot of the times, I. Uh, we didn't have an assay that I had to figure out, oh, we need to measure this indication. We didn't have an assay for it. So you gotta go figure it out. You have to design the assay, validate it, make sure it works, then actually conduct the experiments, interpret all your results, reports to the manager, I have to do company-wide uh, presentations, lead the discussions, then we'd make a decision, does this drug candidate make it through to the next stage or not? Uh, and a lot of times, it'll, if it's the program I'm leading, it defaults to me that, you know, I'll present the data, get everyone's opinion, but at the end of the day, it's like, well, you looked at the data the most, what do you think? So it's like the responsibility is there. And you still have to mentor and train uh, new hires technicians. We do try and publish our results. It does validate if you do an academic collaboration or publish your results. Uh, it does give you that extra validation that what you're doing, if it's been peer evaluated, that it's real science, the you don't get that uh, stigma of, oh, it's a company working behind closed doors. Like, is it real? Uh, so that's uh, so about 50% of my time, I'd say, is spent at the bench or actively performing experiments. Um, a little more than that when I have animal work to do. This includes the training, mentoring, helping other people. So like half my time, I'm down in the wet lab, even as a senior scientist working at the bench. Core of my time is spent dealing with the data, making presentations, trying to evaluate which drug candidate is going to get through, making all these purports presentations. You can imagine some weeks, um, 75% data analysis. You know, that's this is a general like over the year, I'd say it's about worked out like this, but there's some weeks that 100% data analysis because you got a big presentation coming up for the company. Other weeks, you're busy in the lab. So you got to be, again, it comes back to the flexibility. You have all, all kinds of things to do. Uh, and you just got to be able to prioritize. And then about a quarter of my time should be spent reading and writing. But everyone who does a PhD or postdoc knows that when things are happening in the lab, that's the first thing to get sacrificed. So it doesn't always happen. That said, it seems like a lot. It seems stressful. I will say that it is less stressful than my postdoc. So I found that even though I have the more responsibility here, you're doing very similar work. And I do feel that my work-life balance is more protected in the biotech sector that you're expected to give your four hour, 40 hours a week. Sometimes you have to give a little extra. Uh, it's never required of you. Uh, but if you want to move your drug product forward, sometimes you put in the extra effort just because you care. Um, but it's just, yeah, it's not any more stressful. Uh, and a lot of times it just comes down to proper time management that there's always something more to do. 
there's always something that should be done. It's just figure out what needs to be done right now, work on that last week, the next thing gets pushed to the next week. So uh, it seems like a lot, but it's actually pretty nice. Um, so I guess you can maybe guess that, you know, I'm a proponent of, uh, of biotech. So I want to just take a second to that, you know, why might you want to work here? Why I think you might want to work here. And, oh, do you have a question? Oh, all right. So one thing is you have an opportunity to apply all facets of your academic training. That's what I'd say. So everything I did in my postdoc in terms of from bench work to reading to assay design, and like I use everything I did in my postdoc, I do at my current job as a senior scientist at a small company. Uh, I'd say it's similar to academia in that you're on the cutting edge of developing new science. Everything I work on, it's because no one's done it before. I'd say it's just a different edge that we're not interested in answering a basic scientific question because it's interesting. Or that, for example, like we're interested in how these two organisms interact with each other because it's neat. It's more that applied science that we talk about, you know, in the last paragraph of our grants about how our discovery is going to help progress science towards developing a new drug or a new way of diagnostics, a new way of treating something. That that kind of like last paragraph is what we do full time in the biotech sector is we leave the very basic research questions to the academics and we try to uh, read the papers, apply what they've done. And it's all about how do we apply that knowledge to create a better drug? Uh, so great, you get to use your training. The big difference is the, the first point here is that you have to be okay with directed scientific pursuits. If you're gonna be a professor, it's kind of like a blank slate. You get to choose the direction that you wanna move. In the biotech sector, you know, your CSO pretty much tells you what to do, like, but in broad strokes, right? So the biggest difference here is mindset, is will answering this question get me a better drug product? If the answer is yes, you'll probably be allowed to do the experiment. If the answer is no, you're probably going to get told to move on, even if you find this really interesting phenotype. And I've had this happen since I've been here is that we saw something unexpected. It was really interesting, but we had a meeting about it and decided that, well, even if we figure out what this is doing, it's not going to help us choose which drug, which bacteria are going to go in the drug. So we had to drop it. So you have to be able to let something go. And that's really a big thing, because I guess um, like my wife is trying to go the academic route. And she has the inability to do something like that. When I came home and tell her that I had this really interesting result, but I had to let it go. Like it just blew her mind. Like she cannot let that go. She would have to figure out why that's happening. So she belongs in academia. Uh, if you're okay with being told in general direction, study this disease and figure out how to impact this disease in this way. And you're okay with being able to pivot if things aren't working out quite so well, or it's taking a little bit longer, costing too much money. If it's not in the interest of the company, you have to just drop it. Uh, and the other thing for uh, which isn't any different than academia is the time management. It's just that it, you're kind of somewhere between a postdoc and a prof in that no one's gonna tell you how to manage your time or how to accomplish your goals. You're just gonna be given a list of priorities and you're gonna be expected to put those priorities in the proper order, meet the deadlines, and have minimum direction, but still meet all your expectations. Um, and that's very applicable to the training you get in your postdoc and your PhD. You just have to be able to apply that on the next level in the biotech sector. Uh, I'd like to speak a little bit also about difference between two companies. So I worked at Bristol Myers Squibb for five months. I was middle management. Uh, so I reported to a director. So in these companies, like you never see the CSO like the chief scientific officer, big company like that works on the other side of the country. He's in charge of the big picture of the company. Like we never saw him. On our site, uh, so there's many sites across the country. In our site, there is three or four directors of particular programs. And I actually was high enough up that I reported directly to a director. Uh, some people will never even speak to the director. They would report to someone like me. So you have this hierarchy. Uh, 
And the other difference is, you know, in a small startup company, you're dealing with other people's money. Like it's all investment. Uh, at a big company, you actually have revenue. Uh, so I think Bristol Myers Squibb spends some like a couple billion dollars a year on research. <laughs> we apply for grants. Our last series funding, we got 25 million in funding to cover us for years. So it's a you know pond versus ocean type of thing. Uh, so in the larger company, if you get a management type position, you're going to be more management than bench work. You're going to spend more time in meetings, and it's about Keep making sure everything's moving, but you're not the one at the bench making things happen. Uh, but the nice thing is because they have revenue, there is more money for research. So the idea is that if you have a risky idea, they're more receptive towards trying that. The question still remains, this thing that's the same is if, if it's good for the company, it means you're getting yourself closer to a drug product. So you're not doing as much basic research, but if you have a risky idea and it's a little more basic and it might you know, help with the drug discovery program, you're more apt to be able to do that experiment or do that study in a larger company. Uh, the one interesting thing I learned is that I got to a larger company and one in my first week, I asked where all the chemicals and reagents were. I had to make some buffers uh, to run my gels. And my director looked at me and told me, he's like, I pay you too much money to make buffers. We buy everything pre-made. So everything's pre-cast gels, pre-cast made buffer, not even 10 times buffer. Everything's by the one times, so just use it and lose it. Everything's ready to go. So they really spare no expense on reagents and infrastructure because they say in the end of the day, it's a drop in the bucket. Um, the money that you spend in biotech is on clinical trials. Doing anything in humans costs millions upon millions of dollars. So what you do in the lab at the bench is a drop in the bucket, relatively speaking. Time is money. Money is in the salaries and the time that they spare no expense on reagents and infrastructure. Uh, in a startup, you're really more, it's private money. Uh, you have to justify every penny you spend. So you're a little more risk averse. Uh, you spend more time at the bench. You know, there's not this hierarchy, but the advantage there is you're more of a stakeholder in your decision making. That in a big company as a middle manager, I'm not gonna really make the decision about whether something moves on or not. In the small company, as part of my main job is to make decisions that will dictate what goes into the drug or not. So I have direct impact on what, our, what gets put into our drug and I'll be responsible for the final formulation of a drug, which I think is pretty neat. Uh, the one thing about startup is it is easier to get your foot in the door. So at a larger company, there's more expectations. So they tend to hire people who, for middle management and hire, it's hard to start there. Uh, you'd probably be better off getting experience in a small startup and trying to work your way up, but they want someone who's succeeded in some capacity in the biotech sector, because you've proven that you've switched your mindset, you understand how the wheels turn and you can adapt and operate in that environment. Uh, with a startup, they're less, um, what is the word I'm looking for? Um, they can, it's, it's more difficult for them to get those star scientists with all the work experience because the larger company can pay them more. So with a startup, you might be just as good as the other person, but you just lack a little bit of experience. The startups are more likely to give you that chance because they need expertise and versatility employees, but they also may not be able to pay as much for the year's experience in the biotech sector. Um, so I'm going to give you some pointers on the job hunt process, and I'm going to frame it with how I was able to get my job at Global Therapeutics. So the first thing is, as do you have the right qualifications that to sell myself to Schulte, they were looking to expand their portfolio uh, for disease indications in microbiome based therapeutics. So I had a disease focus of insulin resistance and type two diabetes. So I sold myself as a metabolic disease expert. Uh, I'd worked in cells and animal models. So a big selling point for them was my ability to translate from cell culture into a mouse model of insulin resistance. I was familiar with the different mouse models. I could highlight the pros and cons of them, uh, but also I could go back and do this cell biology assay. So they liked the fact that I could do multiple models. And then I see multidisciplinary techniques, which I think is more and more common now that even if you do a mouse study, the idea is you want to 
outsource after you know how to do it. So kind of like outsourcing everything from the get-go for yourself will hurt you in the startup world that they want you to have hands-on experience. They want you to know how to do your DNA, R, DNA and RNA isolations, your qPCR transfections, uh, genetic manipulations of cell lines, uh, reporter assays, your microscopy with physiology, your metabolic testing, animals, tissue harvesting. The more well-rounded you are in terms of using multiple techniques from multiple disciplines, the more likely you are to be attractive to them because you can be that person that wears the many hats and they don't need to hire five people to cover five techniques. They can maybe hire two or three people and cover the same technical expertise. Uh, so the, the, yeah, the advice I have for you is it's great to you know outsource and get things done, but make sure that you have hands-on experience doing everything from start to finish uh, for anything that you put on your resume saying you know how to do this particular technique that you actually have experience doing the entire technique and not just managing people who are doing the technique for you. Uh, so on your resume, the key thing with your resume is providing specific examples. So you have to show that you have the expertise that they need. Uh, <clears throat> so that's all about providing context that we look at resumes and people will list 20 areas of technical expertise. But if you just have a list of techniques, I'm like, okay, you say you know how to do all of these, but I don't understand if you actually know how to do them or if you did one step in the process as part of a team, did you watch someone do it? Uh, I've had interviews where I finally talked to someone and I found out that they looked over the shoulder of the postdoc that was doing the technique and they put the technique on the resume for a technician. And it's like, okay, well, you don't actually know how to do that. So if you want to make sure that they are convinced you know what you're doing, not only do you list your technical abilities, but some kind of description about how you applied them. In what context did you apply them? Um, any way that you can uh, show that you trouble, did some troubleshooting or was able to figure out a problem. Oh, yeah. Uh, we do not use software to pre-screen resumes. Uh, we're not that fancy. We, our CSO actually does the pre-screening process before we meet about any resumes. So it's usually if we post a job on LinkedIn or something, we'll get 200 applicants and he sits there and flips through them. Uh, so in terms of format, it would be like the way, like a, maybe an introductory paragraph that summarizes who you are, what your expertise is, as a, like an objective statement, uh, your, your work experience before your education, definitely. And in that work experience, it would be, um, you know, if the posting was for an allergic disease scientist, did you do allergic disease science? Like in what way, like did you study the responsive macrophages using um, low cytometry to detect receptor expression? Like, so it's like, tell us what you did, but give us some context. And that example will get your resume through to the next round of reading that if we can have an idea of how you applied that technical skill to make your discovery to answer your research question. Um, and in that way, then your area expertise that, okay, you're a macrophage specialist in allergic disease. Great. I can learn that that's what your expertise is. You've studied that. And in that context, you use these technical abilities. I, it's so much more informative for us than to just list worked here, 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 technical expertise in one, two, three, four. Um, that context is in that those examples really help us try to figure out like on paper, like what are your hard skills? Do you have the skills we need? And if you convince us that, oh yeah, it looks like they probably do, we'll want to talk to you. Uh, if it's just a list and there's no context whatsoever, it's like, okay, well, they said the right things. We'll put it in the maybe pile, perhaps. So um, your cover letter should definitely be customized for the job posting. So you should really try to express your excitement. Like, why do you want to work for this particular company? How do you fit? And what do you bring to the position? So really take the keywords from the job posting and try and frame that, you know, you wrote this with me in mind is how you want to try and tailor it. And it's easy to say, it's terribly difficult to do. You get better at it the more you do it, but you really, you know, that's what's going to pop out. Like 
does, is this person the, really the person I want to talk to? Uh, and we're only going to talk to like four or five people out of the 200 applicants. Um, so, you know, do you have the qualifications we need? Make sure those pop out and then make it obvious that, you know, you're really excited to work for this particular company. So for the interview, so if you get through to the interview stage, then it's all about, uh, I'd say the cover letter is equally important as the resume. Uh, Cause again, it provides context. It's your chance to say, you know, my expertise in these helped me to develop the skills you require for this job. And then you like actually name the skills from the job posting. So you wanna really give the job posting back to them in the context of, yeah, you, it's like you were thinking of me when, when you wrote this application and then they'll look at your resume and you'll, they'll get the uh, areas of expertise, your technical skills. Uh, and then they'll decide, yeah, I want to talk to this person. But I'd say without a cover letter, you're going to be hard pressed to get a middle management to senior position, uh, technician position. Yeah, sure. Uh, you can get that with a cover letter because that's a technical position. So your resume will showcase your technical skills and we'll see whether or not you have what we want. Uh, but as a PhD postdoc level scientist, um, if I don't see, if there's no cover letter, I'm not sure you're going to get through. Um, sorry, that was a question in the chat. Um, so if you get to the interview, you know, you got to convince them you're, you're the right person. But you also remember that you know, they invited you in for a reason. So they already think you might be the fit. So provide them with the reason to hire you. Uh, you don't have to be you know, you want to be confident, but not cocky. So you don't want to go in and make them think, you know, no one else can do this job but me. It's more like, well, I'm sure many people could do this job. There's plenty of wonderfully skilled people, but I think that I can do it as well as anyone. And I'm the one standing here. So, you know, don't come out right and say that, but that's kind of your mentality that I can do this job as any, as well as anyone else, but you don't want to make it seem like, you know, you're the only person in the world that can help. Um, and this is your chance in the interview to showcase your soft skills. So your hard skills are really right. The you got your foot in the door because you had the skills required to do the job. Uh, they determined that on your resume. They invite you in because they want to see. Okay, well, do you know what you're talking about? Can you present? Can you? How is your relationships with the people? How do you interact? So these are like all those soft skills we learned during our PhD and postdoc. And Someone explained it to me once that the hard skills are the skills required to do the job. Your soft skills are the skills that help you do the job well. So if you're in the interview, you're really talking about your science, but you're really selling your soft, you're selling your soft skills. Um, and it's a delicate balance that. Uh, so Leslie just asked if all senior scientist positions ask uh, for postdoc experience. So at our company, Yes, that's the, I got a senior scientist position because I came straight out of a postdoc. The other scientists who senior scientists came out of a postdoc. Our two scientists that came directly from PhD came in as scientists, uh, but we did have one, like if it works out within two years, two and a half years, you can get promoted to senior scientist. And at our company, it's more of a, it's more of just a title. Like it's not as important. I mean, it feels good. I'm not gonna lie. So you get the promotion, a little bit of a pay bump, but the day-to-day -day work didn't change by becoming a senior scientist. So they were, even as a scientist, they still had their role in the company. They had their expertise that was unique to them. I went to them for help. They didn't work for me. They weren't lower on the rung of the ladder than me because they were a senior scientist and I was a senior scientist. But, you know, it looks good on a resume. Uh, but yeah, the short answer is in, in Schulte, coming in straight from a PhD, you're probably going to be a scientist. If you have the postdoc experience, you can come in as a senior scientist. Um, yeah. So the idea, the delicate balance is you need to have enough of the skills they want so that you can do the job walking in the door because they don't want to train someone at a senior level extensively. But you do want to demonstrate your ability to you know, learn quickly and adapt new skills on the job. For example, uh, I had never done microbiology before I started here. We're a company that does anaerobic microbiology. So I've learned that in the last three years. So 
they did not hire me because I couldn't do the microbiology. We had people that were excellent at that and they were able to teach me. They hired me because I had a particular set of skills they were lacking in the metabolic disease and animal model uh, realm. So I came on and I was really good at, and I taught people my things and I was able to learn from them their skills. So your ability to pivot and learn and adapt your skills is great, but you do have to bring something. No company is going to hire you for your ability to learn something new. They're, you have to have something they want to get your foot in the door. Um, so it's kind of like, it's all about what you can do for them walking in the door. You have to fill a hole in their expertise, either technical or knowledge-based, if you want uh, to be successful at getting that particular job. Because again, they're going to pay, they're paying people a lot of money to do something. They're not paying you to learn. So it's not a training position. It is very much have to have that skills coming in. Um, and even in the interview, examples are everything. Uh, that every time you tell them you know how to do something or you have an expertise in this particular technique or you have an in-depth understanding of this particular field, you know, give them context. So in that interview, uh, I just put these bullet points here. These are something I got from one of the uh, workshops I went to. Is like, what are you doing in this interview? And really in the interview, they're trying to figure out, you know, can you be successful in this particular position? Do they want to work with you? I mean, even in academia, the, during the job interview process, uh, you know, you're trying to figure out if you want to, you want that person as a colleague for the next decade, you know, job, you tend not to stay for a whole decade at one company, but the idea is the next three to five years, do I want to work with you? Uh, and do you really want to work in this particular position? Uh, I have a question about uh, smaller companies. Do you recommend sending in your resume even if there's no current positions? Uh, you're probably not going to get a lot of traction if they're not hiring and you set they you send the chief scientific officer an email with a resume. Uh, they have they get you know 100 150 emails a day. They're going to look at the most important ones relative to the operation of the company. If you're trying to get your foot in the door, I would, and you see a company you like, instead of going directly for the bosses, go for one of the scientists, find someone on LinkedIn that works there and try and reach out to them. So I've had people reach out to me on LinkedIn before that, hey, I really like your company, you know, would you mind talking with me? And set up an informational interview and just get information about the company, talk to them. Now they know who you are, you've had a meeting. Uh, and maybe they'll keep you in mind when there is a position. So I wouldn't recommend just sending your resume in unprompted, but I do encourage networking. That the one thing I learned is knowing people matters. That I didn't get a lot of traction until I was out here and I met some people. It's hard to meet people when you're back in Canada if you're trying to get your foot in the door. So the best thing you can do is use your social media platforms. Find someone from that particular company you're interested in who's active on social media and try and connect with them. Uh, if they're willing to have an informational interview with you, great. You can tell them about yourself, what you're excited about, you know, ask them a little bit about the company. At least then, you know, you have that personal connection with someone at the company. Because uh, a lot of times, like, for example, we're about to hire, we're about to post for a technician. We had uh, two companies beside us say, oh, I know someone who's looking for a job right now. Here's a resume. So it's kind of like someone's vouch for them. And that kind of information, I mean, if we're going to, do we want to look through 200 resumes or do we want to take one of the two resumes that, you know, what, what someone we know has vouched for the person. So making connections is probably the most important to getting your foot in the door. So yeah, don't send the resume ran this unprompted, but do reach out and try and connect with someone at the company. It's just probably not going to be the CEO or CSO, uh, but look for some of the scientists. Um, the same Kevin, ideas with I have a small question here too. Yeah. Uh, on interview, like you talked about confidence versus arrogance. Yeah. Can you also talk about like professionalism versus like showing more your personal approachable self or you could get too informal? Yeah, uh, I mean, there's all, I guess it's a delicate balance. Uh, at a smaller company, they do want to see more of that personal side. They do want to see if you're a decent person that they can joke around with. Like I, I, I dropped a few puns. I know there's a couple of people in the audience that know me that aren't surprised about that. But the idea is like, shh, you don't want to do it to a detriment where they think that you're just a jokester and you don't know what you're talking about. But if you can demonstrate, you know what you're talking about, but you can throw in a little light humor, you can show that, you know, you have personal interest when you generally, if you get in for an interview, 
you'll do more of that formal presentation, but then you have one-on-one -on -one meetings and it's just like a conversation like this. Like they're just trying to figure out, you know, are you who you say you are? Like mm -hmm. you seem smart enough. You seem like you got the technical skills, but is it like talking to a brick wall when I try and have a conversation with you? You can bring up hobbies and something that, oh, I like hiking. Oh, what's your favorite uh, beach in California? Like I just, oh, I'm, yeah, if I'm going to move out there, like I've heard the weather's really nice. Like you can talk about stuff other than the mm -hmm. science, try and get a little more personable. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you wouldn't go so go in great, great depth. I'm like, oh, so are you married? Do you have kids? Where, where do your kids go to school? Like, like there's a certain amount of personal information that you don't get into in like the first meeting, but general if they offer up like, oh, well, yeah, well, me and my partner, we like to go here. Oh, cool. Like, you don't fish for information, but you can offer up information and see if they reciprocate about, you know, hobbies and your general interest in the area. One of the big things in an interview, too, is your excitement to be there, not only at the company, but you want to be in that area. So like, oh, yeah, I heard great things about the Bay Area. It'd be really nice to settle down there. Like, I'm really interested in coming, you know, getting out there and enjoying the weather and you know, not shoveling snow anymore. Like it's just little tidbits, but it's like, are you, do you want to actually be in that physical location? And do you want to work for that company? And then they feel like, oh, there's going to be some stability with this person. If they work out, they're not going to jump ship right away. They seem like they, they really want to be here and they want to be in this particular location. Um, and you might like, they're, they're evaluating you, but you're also evaluating them. So you want to see, you know, Will they give you what you need to succeed? So it's one thing to work, walk into a company like this seems great, but if you know they're not going to give you the resources you need, like they don't have the piece of equipment. No, we won't get that. You'll have to figure out another way. No, we don't do mouse work, but you're a mouse specialist and you want to do some translational work. No, you can't have a technician. You have to do everything yourself, but it's going to take 70 hours a week. Like there's red flags that you, I'm not saying most, I've not seen companies that are like that, but you're trying to make sure that they will provide you with things you need. Do you want to work with those people and do their um, values fit yours? Like I saw some job postings when I was looking for my jobs. There's a job at a company, well, I mean, Juul. So it's a flavored tobacco company. And they were looking for a biochemist to look at interactions of their small molecules with receptors. And it fit my job description, but I would not apply for that position because I do not want to go look at how I can better have tobacco-based small molecules bind to my pleasure receptors. Like it's not what I want to do with my work. Um, uh, so, oh, there's just a question. What are the chances of getting a position in the US if one is applying from Canada? That is an terribly difficult question to answer to put a number on it. It really depends on fit. So I will tell you, it is much harder than if you're already here. I got success because I was already physically here. So I could go in person for my interview, talk to them, uh, convince them about the TN visa. I was able to convince them in person that, you know, this isn't that big of a deal. I can get a work permit. You know, if you hire me, like I can do this because uh, they had never heard of the program and they were a little skeptical. So smaller companies, they might not know all of the options of the visas. They might get scared about having someone come from out of country that doesn't already have a work permit. Uh, that's where the networking comes in that unfortunately it all comes down to do you know someone so they're reaching out to scientists from companies you might be interested in if they have any interaction with you whatsoever they're more likely to look at you um other than that you have to be pretty a pretty perfect fit to get them to hire you over someone local so there one thing i will say there is a lot of scientists around here like there's a lot of quality schools in the bay area there are people here, but I said, um, if you fit the job really well and you convince them that, you know, you really want me, of all your applicants, like, I think I can do this job as anyone else that comes through your door and I'm here right now, you can get the job, but it's not going to be something where, oh, they fit almost and they can learn on the job. That If you're physically here, you might be able to get one of those jobs, but applying remotely, you're not going to get that job where... Um, you know, you're a kind of a good fit and you could, they could see you growing into the role, but if they have to jump through hoops and you don't already have all the boxes checked on their checklist, you're probably not going to get it. They'll find someone who's similar enough in local. So that's the unfortunate part about applying to like California based jobs from Canada is you have to be a better fit for the job than you might otherwise need to be if you're already physically here. But that's also where making connections with people here can help you get over that hump that if they kind of 
know who you are, even if they've never met you in person. Oh, yeah, I talked to that person. Oh, yeah, they seemed like a decent person. They were easy to talk to. They have pretty much a skill set. Maybe we should give them a chance. So it's all about, yeah, it's all about getting your foot in the door. And I will tell you, it is very tough to get your foot in the door. Uh, uh, and it's just persistence. Uh, but I have a slider later. Like I'll tell, I, uh, I applied to more than 50 positions and it took me eight months to get my first job. So number of cover letters and tailoring of resumes and some of these things I was learning, I was doing these workshops. And so I'm trying to kind of download on you all the information I learned over eight months of trying to find a job in an hour. Uh, and yeah, it's, uh, I'm not gonna say it's easy, uh, but it is doable. Uh, I do know people who have moved down here. I have two friends who have moved down here on TN visas, getting jobs from Canada, while applying from Canada to the States. So it can happen. It's just, I'm not gonna lie and tell you that it's easy. Uh, so I see that I'm running close on time. So we're gonna, uh, these are kind of points from some of the workshop in, uh, workshops I did. So since these presentations, this presentation is gonna be available later, we'll kind of just, these are just the bullet points to have you, um, of the main take, main highlights from these workshops. So I don't, not gonna go through all of these now with you. Uh, big thing is knowing why, why do you fit? Uh, what are your strengths? So what are the skills you have that they should want? And it's all about examples. Uh, always be specific with your examples, promote yourself and be enthusiastic. No one wants to hire someone that maybe kind of might want to come work for them. And like that comes across and like, if you're talking softly, yeah, you know, I, you know, you seem like a really great company or you sit here like, yeah, I know I'm really excited to work for you. At the prospect of working for your company, like the tone and the inflection matters. Um, if the job talk, um, you know, knowing your audience, not everyone in the room is a scientist. We have business offers, clinical coordinators. They're all sitting in and giving their opinion on you. So you don't want to make it seem like you're treating them like they're dumb, but you also want to make sure that everyone in the room is accessible to what you're trying to describe. And that's kind of like giving a talk at any big conference that you're going to have a breadth of expertises and you got to make your talk accessible to everyone. We've been trained for this. You just got to make sure you do it well when you, even in a small company, when there's only seven people in the room, treat it as if you were at a conference with 200 people in the room and make it sure everyone can understand. Um, and it's all about telling a story, uh, capture their attention and really tell them, you know, what have you contributed so far through your work to science, how is that going to help their company grow? How is it going to help them develop their next drug product? You are as good as anyone that can do this position. Thing. Um, when you're asking questions, you can ask about the environment, though, stress, you want to be part of a team, you like collaboration, have an answer for why you're leaving academia. If it's because funding sucks and you're grumpy, like that's not an answer. You say, I'm excited about the prospect of developing a drug that's gonna actually make it in the clinic. Like I'm gonna make something that goes into humans. That is exciting. I want to do that. You know, That's why you're leaving academia. Not because you know, I didn't know what to do with my life. So you, know, you guys are my part plan B. No one wants to be your plan B. Um, you can ask about compensation, your healthcare, dental, drug plan. These things are important down in the States because they're not automatic. Your, your employer pays for them for you. So you want to know what kind of uh, what kind of coverage you got. Uh, future career prospects at that particular company. Is there room to move up? Is there room for growth for you professionally? Uh, that kind of thing. Um, so one thing I'll to mention that if you're still in your PhD, so if you're at the end of your postdoc, this isn't really going to apply. But if you're in your PhD, and you think you want to go into the biotech sector, kind of look it up, look up jobs, like where do you want to work and then develop technical skills for that field. For example, like more than half of biotech out here is cancer-based. So if you want to be able to work in the cancer-based immunotherapy realm, you should probably do a work on at least one project, do it if you're not in a cancer lab, do a collaboration where you do some immune assays, flow cytometry, something with the immune system, either adaptive or innate, doesn't matter, but like do something in that realm so you can showcase that you have hard skills in that realm. I applied to a bunch of immuno-oncology positions. I didn't get any of them. I got one or two interviews after talking with me. I told them how my expertise is 
translatable and I could work in that. And they agreed with me. And they're like, yeah, we think you'd be fine, but we can also find someone who's just similar skill set who actually has already worked in this field. So we're going to hire them. So if you want to be a walk in cancer biology and biotech, you should probably do something related to immune cells during your PhD. And then if you're going to do a postdoc, do something cancer-based. So if you kind of know what you want to work in in biotech to begin with, make sure you develop the skills, technical skills, those hard skills that you're going to need when you get out here. So microbiology, again, familiarity with coding, um, sequencing technologies, host microbe interactions, molecular biology, anything genetic engineering, genetic manipulations. Like if you know that's what you want to go into, then you need to learn those skills in your academic training. They're not going to teach them to you here. Unless you already have a different set of, set of skills they want, you can learn them once you get here. Like I learned microbiology once I got here, but I already had a set of skills they wanted. So if you want these, these to be the skills they want, you have to already have them going in. Because again, it's all about what can you do for them coming in to help them grow, succeed, fill a gap that they have. Um, and also, so this is the idea that I applied to over 50 positions in eight months before I got my position at, position at BMS. Uh, hey, short message is it's never too late to begin networking. It's all about talking to people, finding out. Uh, it's actually a much smaller community than you think that I worked with people at BMS that I then left and I ran into them in my startup because there's 40 companies here and they moved to one of the other companies and they worked on the bench beside me. They just showed up one day and the guy sitting beside me was the guy I hired when I was a hiring manager at BMS. So like, you never know who you're going to bump into and it's a much smaller world than you think it is. So make connections, don't burn bridges. Uh, and the more people who know you, the more likely you are to get that foot in the door somewhere. Uh, the idea is resume is your time to sell your hard skills. Your, the interview is really the time to sell your soft skills. I mean, you can highlight your soft skills in your resume, but you're going to sell them to them in the interview. But to get to the interview, you got to convince them on your resume that you have the hard skills they need uh, or that they want for everything. And again, examples for everything. Uh, everyone can list that they know QPCR, but if you can highlight your strengths by showing them that, oh, well, it wasn't working. I developed my own primers and my own um, like TACMAN based pro, I, I looked on probe design. Like you can add that extra layer. If you have it, like advertise it, like tell them that you have this extra layer or like, you know exactly how to use this. Like if it's one thing to know how to do something when everything's working right, there's another thing that you know how to do it when it's not working right. And if you have that experience, make sure you highlight it. Uh, and I know we're getting to the hour, so I'm gonna, um, Give you some salary information because this is something no one talks about no one talks about their salaries it's a very much a faux pas to no one knows what each other make so i can tell you that when you're trying to figure out your salary you have to know your worth well you can't know your worth if no one tells you anything about what to expect and another big thing is provide examples to back up what you're asking it's okay to ask for more but you have to give them a reason why they should pay you more and that's the idea is like well i have the, the technical expertise i've been doing this for six years you need that skill. I have expertise in that skill for six years. So I deserve to be paid. Like I know I've done it for six years, not six months type of thing. Uh, PhD level scientists, you're looking at anywhere from 106 to 130 US dollars, 130,000 US dollars, depending on your role and responsibilities. Uh, just before the pandemic, like pure computational people were in demand. They were getting close to 130,000. If you're a wet lab person, you're getting more like 120 if at the higher end. Um, if you have postdoc experience, it, it may or may not be considered. Some of the bigger companies, they don't care if you have a postdoc or not. Uh, my company actually got the senior scientist title because I had my postdoc experience. I got given more responsibility at the beginning because of my postdoc experience. So with that experience, um, you know, $120,000 to $140,000 a year. Um, senior scientist, you can push, you know, you would really, if you are going to get the title senior scientist, you should push push for at least 130, 160 is high. Like that's something like a bigger company. Uh, one of the bigger companies out here is Genentech. Have you heard of them? They fancy themselves like an academic slash industry. They hire PIs and treat them like academics. They expect you to publish. You're running a small group. Like they actually have like academic endeavors in their, within their company. It's really bizarre model. It's as close to academia as you can get in industry. Um, but it also depends on benefit package. Like some of those people are on contracts, so they'll pay you $170,000 a year, but you have to pay for your own healthcare. That's going to cost you 50, 
thousand dollars a year. Like so, you know, it all comes out in the wash anyway. So your take home after your benefits and everything, you know, hundred thirty to one hundred forty thousand dollars a year, you're doing fine. Uh, if you get the hundred fifty, it's because you're something really special and they really need you. Um, but it's possible. But you know, I wouldn't expect that. But anywhere like hundred hundred twenty to one hundred forty. Uh, as a senior scientist uh, with postdoc experience. Yeah. Uh, and just to, so providing examples that my first position at BMS was hourly wage. There's a $20 an hour range that they could pay me and they, I didn't negotiate. And I forced them to give me the highest amount because the qualifications they wanted was a bachelor's and I had a PhD with postdoc experience. I told them like, there's no way you're giving me the lower end of that. Like I have more education. I have like 10 years more education than you require for the job. You give me the max. And I'm like, because I've done this, 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 and this technically. And that's what's on the job. And they're like, okay. Like as long as you can justify it, you can give them an example to justify why you're asking what you're asking. And a lot of times they'll be like, okay. So as long as respectfully stand your ground. I didn't yell at them. I didn't tell them that they are idiots. You know, respectfully just give it like, well, actually, I think I'm worth this because. And you'd be amazed that you can actually get that extra 5k a year maybe that uh, you think you deserve. Um, so on the last few slides, uh, TN application. So this is, I guess we're running out, ran out of time, so we won't go over all of it, but it's a three-year temporary work permit. There's no avenue for green card. It's part of NAFTA. You must be a citizen. There's a list of uh, professions that qualify. So do not put something that doesn't qualify. Don't make up a job title. Scientist works, biochemist works. Uh, don't be like technical director of experimental microbiology. If it's not on the list, it doesn't qualify. So when you fill out the application, you put something that's on the list. And there's plenty of scientist positions on the list, but just make sure to pick the one that applies to you. It is renewable. The stressful thing is you apply at the border with bags in hand. So you, you show up at the border and be like, I'm here to work. And they take you in the back into secondary and they go through your application and they decide on the spot if they give you the stamp to continue on your plane to go to California for your job. But you have to have the job offer in hand as well, which is the, with a smaller company can be the difficulty that what we're taking a chance on this person and giving them a job offer and they don't even have a work permit and they're gonna promise us they're gonna get out of the airport on the way here. Some people mentally that's a roadblock for them and you gotta be able to convince them. So if you're a good enough fit, you know, you can get them over that hump. Um, and this is just a list of the things. And if you, I know we're at the end. So if you need, um, no, you can't apply in advance. You have to do it. You have to do the stressful application and bag in hand and you, because they give you entry immediately. They stamp your passport and tell you to continue on your way to your airplane. Uh, so it can be a little stressful that part. Um, uh, some companies have lawyers that'll do everything for you. My, I was lucky enough that my friend worked for a company that had a lawyer that did everything for them. I had to do it myself, but he gave me the information. Uh, yes, bring your original. Good, good call, Leslie. I, I have your original copy of your PhD with you. Um, you're going to have to have a credentials evaluation report with you. Uh, so Park Evaluations is a company I used in Canada that verifies, they do a background check on you and make sure that your PhD in Canada is equivalent to a U.S. institution. Uh, it seems obvious, but it isn't to a border guard. You need to prove that, you know, your degree is the same as if you had a degree from, you know, UCSF down in San Francisco. So have your trans, have copy your transcripts, have your degree. It really depends on the border agent you get. He didn't really look at mine, but it's on the list if you have to have it with you. So it's better to have it and have, and if they see that you have the stack of paper and everything is there, they go, oh, okay. And then they just go through it. If you give them a short stack of paper and it's not all there, uh, you know, you're going to have a hard time. Uh, the employer petition is very important. And I have a list of all the things that it needs to be on there. And, and, and if, I mean, now that we're, we're all meeting each other, if you get to the point where you're interviewing and you need to apply for a TN and you have this list, if you need an example of the employer petition, you can connect with me. I will give you my employer petition letter so that you can model it. I had someone give me theirs and I just restructured it with, my information so that it was read exactly as it should be. And it was one that was prepared by a lawyer for someone else. I took theirs as a template and made mine. So if you get to the point where you need to write this letter yourself because you don't have a company with a lawyer, I can share 
an example with you and you can use mine as a template. Uh, and then look me up and we'll go for a beer when you get down here. Uh, you need your resume, passport, employer EIN number. Don't ask me to say what that is, but your employer will know what that is. Employer background, one page description, employer certificate of incorporation to prove they're a real corporation and not some kind of shell company. Copies of any immigration documents that you might have. Uh, optional, but I would say do it, is have a couple reference letters. Uh, so I had a reference letter from my CSO and from John Scherzer in hand with me. But yes, this person is a legit scientist. He's really good at his does. Please let him in the country. Um, so, all right. so that's a list of all the TM stuff. If you need any elaboration, if you get to a point where it's important for you to know more information about this stuff, you can reach out to me. I can give you some templates. So I guess final summary, uh, we looked at job responsibilities. You will use all of your academic training if you're working in a startup. Uh, the major difference is that whole mindset that it's, you know, will this help us make a better drug? Yes or no. Um, and then there's differences between larger and startup is largely centered around funding that uh, how much risk can you take with your project and how much time will you spend at the bench? Because in a bigger company, you're going to be more at the desk than a bench. Uh, so you wouldn't do a TN for a post uh, postdoc, you do a J1 visa. Um, it actually is easier. So if you're a PhD and you want to come down, oh, really? Cool. I didn't know that was an option. Uh, so Samaya, when she came down here, she was on a J1 visa for her postdoc. Um, I will say the nice thing about a J1 is that a spouse can get a J2 and uh, J2 is eligible to apply for a work permit. So that's actually how I got my first job is I had a work permit when I was down here, but my work permit expired and I had to switch to a TN. So I actually had to fly to Vancouver, re-enter the country through the TN application process and try and come back and hope I still had a job when I got back because I had to renew all my visa process a different way. Um, so yeah, I guess it depends on the school. If the school has the administration for it and they do the J visas, I'd say a J visa is better than a TN. Um, but if you have to do a TN and you then, like Leslie said, you can do a TN for postdoc. Oh, sorry, if, uh, if you're a PhD and you wanna come down for a postdoc, uh, it's better to be here in person. So if you're doing a postdoc and you think you wanna work in biotech in the Silicon Valley, try and do a postdoc at a school in California. You'll, make, you'll just meet people who have connections to startups. Everyone, every big lab out of the, the big five schools down here has startups spin out of their groups. So you'll have connections to people who work in biotech just by doing a postdoc in a school down here. Do you think you want to go to Boston? Do a, try and do a postdoc at a school in Boston because you'll make connections to the people who work in biotech in Boston. Just being physically present will give you a huge leg up um, if you're able to you know, get a position uh, as a postdoc in the place you think you're going to want to work later is a huge advantage to physically be present. So that all said, I hope that Maybe now you'll think that, you know, biotech is just a different bright road for using your PhD, uh, that I really enjoy it down here. Uh, I, I find it very fulfilling. Uh, you use the same skill, like I said, just a little bit different mentality, a little different application of your skills, but in the end, it's the same discovery research to try and make something better. It's, it's wonderful. So anyway, uh, that is it. I know I went a little over. Uh, but hopefully that was uh, some useful information. Thanks.